Hello, everybody. My name is Andy Catcher. I'm the NoFast Communications Director, and I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar that's part of the NoFast webinar series. And uh, today uh, we have a presentation on the topic of implications of FASD for the adoptive family presented by Dr. Ira Chasnoff. And we're going to introduce uh, Dr. Chasnoff in just a moment. I'd just like to go through a quick overview of how the, this webinar will work. Uh, we'll have a presentation, and then after the conclusion of the presentation, uh, people are welcome to ask questions at any time. You can actually start typing in your question now, and we're gonna, I'll come back on and ask uh, the questions that were submitted uh, to our presenter. Um, and yeah, just make sure to, to type your question as soon as you think of it. Uh, we may not have time to get through every question, but in order to ensure the greatest likelihood of your question being answered, definitely want to just make sure and uh, type your question as soon as possible. And this webinar will go from 2 o'clock uh, and conclude at 3 o'clock Eastern Time. So uh, also, we just like to remind everyone that a video the video recording, including uh, the video and the audio of this presentation, will be made available on the NoFest website within 24 hours after the conclusion of the, this presentation. And you can find that by going to uh, the NoFest website, nofest.org, and uh, clicking on the button for webinars, and we'll have a link there to view the video. The slides themselves will not be available, but the video recording of the webinar will be available on the NoFest website. And uh, we also encourage you to connect with NoFest on uh, social media. You can sign up for uh, be a, connect with us on Facebook and Twitter, and also you can sign up to subscribe to the NoFest Weekly Roundup, which is a once-a-week uh, email newsletter that goes out uh, every Monday with a lot of useful information on updates in the FASD field and uh, the latest research and events and that sort of thing. So this time I'm going to turn uh, turn it over to NoFest Vice President and Spokesperson Kathy Mitchell. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. We are just delighted to welcome Dr. Ira Chasnov, who is an award-winning author, researcher, and lecturer, and president of NTI Upstream, which is a multimedia production and publishing company. Dr. Chasnov is a pediatrician and a dear friend to the National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome. He's one of the nation's leading researchers in the field of child development and the effects of maternal alcohol and drug use on the newborn infant and child. He is a researcher and has overseen many, many uh, studies uh, looking at long-term cognitive and behavioral effects on children, but also into what, what works, how can we help children, and I know uh, some of his studies has uh, 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 found some great success in addressing issues of self-regulation. Dr. Chasnov is one of these creative, talented people that uh, you just, he says he's, uh, he's retired, but we know he's, uh, you know, he'll never truly be retired. He has written so many papers, I wouldn't be able to list them all in an hour. He is a regular contributor to Psychology Today, and he's written numerous books, I believe seven books, the latest of which, The Mystery of Risk, which I believe he will be focusing a lot of the um, uh, content on today. I, I will have to mention a book that I just love on international adoption called Risk and Promise is one of those books that everyone should have in their, their library, all um, uh, families living with FAS. He's all over the map. He's all over the world. He's established comprehensive family intervention programs in Australia, Denmark, Portugal, Vietnam, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I know he's busy uh, right now establishing or creating a uh, new clinic in Hawaii, and I hope hopefully he's going to tell you about that. And the one thing I just want to say about Dr. Ira Chasnoff, he is... Um, He's one of these doctors that you wish you could clone because as a pediatrician, he's got a huge heart. And along with this heart, he has a wealth of knowledge. And I, I personally believe 
He is uh, the best pediatrician you could ever go to or consult with in terms of understanding FASD. So with that, I'll turn it over back to Andy, who will turn it over to Ira. Uh, yes, you can go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kathy, thank you for that um, for that introduction. I'm a little um, taken aback, but uh, it was very nice of you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, a lot of our work uh, is grounded in working with children and families who have come through the foster care system uh, in the various states, and we do a lot of work with adoptive families. Uh, and one of the interesting things for me as a clinician is I've had numerous families that have come to me that adopted a child right at birth. And that adoptive family has done everything you could ever ask a family to do to interact with, support, to nurture that infant. And at two and three years of age, they bring the child to us because uh, they're having problems. And we more and more frequently are making a diagnosis of reactive attachment disorder in young children. Now, that's very, we, we try not to make that diagnosis, but sometimes that's the only thing that will explain the whole picture. And what we're finding is that attachment has become a key consideration uh, when, especially when you bring a child into an adoptive home, a child specifically who has been exposed to alcohol prenatally. So the talk today is not going to be a primer on FAS. I think all of you have the basic information, but rather I want to talk about prenatal alcohol exposure from the perspective of attachment. Now attachment is the interconnectedness between human beings. It's the way we react and interact with each other. And there are two requirements for attachment. Each individual in the dyad must be able to read the other individual's cues and then secondly, each individual must be able to respond to the other's cues. Now, often when you get a child with an attachment disorder, the first thing that everyone looks at, well, the mother obviously is inadequate, the father is inadequate, they haven't done a good job nurturing the child. But what most folks miss and what they don't think about is that the child has responsibility in developing attachment. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, attachment from the perspective of the child who has been exposed prenatally to alcohol. So two essential caregiver qualities, as I said, are responsiveness and accessibility. But what we're going to focus on and what I want you to really consider is that the infant must possess the qualities of responsiveness and accessibility. We're going to look at this from the perspective of information processing. That is the way an individual of any age brings information into the brain and uses it. And there are four steps in this process. There's input, integration, memory, and output. Now what does that mean? Let's pretend that uh, you have a big library that you have to supply. So you go out into the stores and you buy a bunch of books and you gather up all those books and you bring them into your new library. That's input. You then organize the books probably alphabetically. That's integration. You store the books up on the beautiful new bookshelves you have around the room. That's memory. And then when you want a book, say, Green Eggs and Ham, you go to S for Dr. Seuss and pull that book off the shelf. That's output. Now, that's the way your brain works, by bringing information in, organizing it, storing it in memory, and then having it available to affect your actions at a later point. That's output. Now, this is the brain. Uh, to your left is the frontal lobe. You'll see where it's labeled. Uh, toward the back is the parietal lobe. At the very back, the occipital lobe. And on the sides, the temporal lobe. Uh, now, there's no test. You don't have to remember the parts of the brain. But here's what I want you to consider. 
In information processing, the four steps. The first step is input, how we bring information into the brain. And what you have to realize is depending on the kind of information it is, it takes a different track into the brain. For example, anything you see enters the eye, travels along the optic nerve, which runs the entire length of the brain, and inserts on the visual cortex, which is in the very back of the brain in the occipital lobe. So the part of the brain you see with, essentially, is the back part of the brain. Anything you hear comes in from, through the ear, travels along the auditory nerve, and inserts on the midline of the brain. And that's auditory input. And then taste, touch, and smell enter through the parietal lobe toward the near top back part of the brain. Now the job of the brain is to bring that information together to organize it. So visual information coming in through the eye and inserting in the back of the brain, the occipital lobe, auditory information coming in through the ear and inserting in the midline of the brain, and taste, touch, and smell coming in through the parietal lobe, the back top part of the brain. That information is integrated. So that's the second step. That's sensory integration, which some of you may have heard of. And then the information is stored in the back of the brain as perceptions and memories. And when it's time for you to use that information, that information shoots forward to the prefrontal cortex. And the prefrontal cortex is right up here in the front part of the brain, and that's called the regulatory center of the brain because that's how you regulate behavior. So let's just take an example. You see you're walking along the street, and you're going to cross the street, and you look to see, and there's a car coming. That car, the visual of the car, enters the eye, travels the whole length of the brain, hits the visual cortex, flash, there's the car. That information then shoots forward to the prefrontal cortex, which triggers dopamine that fires off the muscles that say, stop walking. And so that's called motor regulation. You can think of any type of regulatory behaviors, whether it's focus and attention, whether it's uh, uh, trying to remember things, whether it's crossing the street, uh, whether it's your emotional regulation. All aspects of regulation essentially go through this same pathway. Now, where does prenatal alcohol exposure come in? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to save that slide. So now let's, let's talk about prenatal alcohol exposure. I'm not going to go through the diagnosis very much or show a lot of pictures because, again, I'm assuming all of you are well aware of the criteria for fetal alcohol syndrome. I just want to make sure that there are some very confusing terminologies out there now. Uh, fetal alcohol syndrome is when a child has been exposed to alcohol, has growth impairments, facial malformations, and the neurodevelopmental difficulties. Now, a child who's been exposed to alcohol but has normal growth but has the facial features and the neurodevelopmental difficulties, those children have partial FAS, are sometimes called FAS with normal growth. And then finally, there are those children, and the majority of you have these children in your home. The majority of alcohol-exposed children physically look perfectly fine. They have normal growth, they have normal facial features, but they have the significant neurodevelopmental difficulties, which we'll get into. And sometimes that's the most difficult group to work with because the schools don't believe there's anything wrong with the child. They can say, oh, he's fine at school. It's your parenting that's the problem. When, in fact, the structure of the school and the one-on-one -on -one attention the child may be getting is what helps him regulate. Those children 
the terminology up until recently was alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, ARND. With the publication of the DSM-5, we are in the transition of now using the term NDPAE, neurodevelopmental disorder with prenatal alcohol exposure. Now, for your purposes right now, that's not going to make much difference. In the future, we hope that because we're able to code this through the DSM-5, perhaps insurance and Medicaid will now cover the services that the children need. Now, for the rest of the afternoon, I will be talking about all prenatally exposed children because it doesn't matter if they have FAS, partial FAS, ARND, or NDPAE, they all have the neurodevelopmental difficulties, which is what most of you are struggling with. Now, the catch-all term is FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. It's an umbrella term that includes everything else. Now let's talk about the face just very briefly. The facial changes with alcohol exposure reflect a mid-face hypoplasia, which means hypo means under, plasia is growth, so it's really an undergrowth of the mid-face. And you have a small head that's microcephaly, not always, but often. You have folds that come over the middle of the eye, the epicanthal folds, a flat nasal bridge, here are the epicanthal folds, a flat nasal bridge, upturned nose, and then the area between the bottom of the nose, the top of the lip, is called the philtrum, and it should have a nice groove down the center. But in children with alcohol exposure, many of them, this area, the philtrum, is flattened. There's a thin upper lip and a receding jaw. Now, this is a young lady. Uh, the, the baby, uh, Brittany, is three months old. Uh, you can see the folds over the middle of the eyes, the epicanthal folds, the flat nasal bridge, the upturned nose, the flat philtrum, the thin upper lip. This is Brittany at nine months. You can see the facial features. Five years of age, 12 years of age. Brittany is now 22, uh, and I'll be talking about our recent film in just a moment, and she's one of the stars of the film. Now, where I want to focus today, let's go back to where we want to focus, which is on attachment and how alcohol exposure affects attachment. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen this slide before. It's from Sterling Claren's collection. On the right is a normal brain of a six-week-old that died of, of crib death. On the left is a six-week-old who died with fetal alcohol syndrome. You can see the significant difference in size, but most importantly, look at the different in, difference in the texture of the brain. Now, these are called gyri and sulci. I just call them folds because here's what happens. In the third trimester of pregnancy, it is a period of such rapid brain growth that the brain that is growing in utero has trouble fitting inside the skull. And so what happens, the brain grows, but you can see the outer edges of the brain, the cortex, starting to develop folds all the way through the third trimester. So this is a normal brain. Now this is a series of CT scans of a fetal brain taken from, we're looking down on the fetal brain. Now this is important because as these folds develop, you increase the surface area of the brain. And there's a direct correlation between brain surface area and IQ. So a child's cognitive functioning, as global cognitive functioning as affected by alcohol, is really a product of third trimester exposure. So many of you may have children with normal IQs. You don't have the, the high rate of intellectual disabilities uh, that we see in children with fetal alcohol syndrome. 
but that's because the mother may have been using early in pregnancy and then by third trimester stopped using. And so you get normal gyri and sulci, normal folds in the brain, so you get a normal IQ, but it's the more subtle effects of the alcohol exposure in early pregnancy that are impacting your child. Now, this is just review. Remember, we talked about information processing. Information travels through different parts of the brain, moving forward to hit the prefrontal cortex. Now, the part I left out before is the way information gets from the back of the brain through perception and memories to the front of the brain to the regulatory center of the brain. And that part of the brain, the responsible for helping to integrate information and to move it forward in the brain for regulation is called the limbic system. And the limbic system sits in the exact midline of the brain and is the primary target of alcohol use in the first trimester. So this is a schematic drawing of the limbic system. But here's an MRI. Now this is a normal MRI. The outer shell, the cortex, you can see, and all the lines are the folds that we were talking about in the brain. You can see how well they're organized. And then this midsection is the limbic system. And I want you to pay attention to this structure right here. This is the corpus callosum. The corpus callosum is the superior portion of the limbic system. Now, up in the upper left-hand corner is the normal MRI. In this larger picture of the MRI, this is one of our children uh, named Alan. And you can see his mother drank heavily in third trimester because of all the distortion of the cortex. And see, you don't have all of those nice uh, folds in the brain. His IQ is 52. But the other thing I want you to pay attention to is the corpus callosum. And you can see how the corpus callosum is misshapen. It seems to be tilting a little bit forward and it's thickened. These changes in the corpus callosum can prevent it or can uh, it, hamper its ability to transmit information. And the corpus callosum is primarily responsible for moving information from one side of the brain to the other and to moving information up so that you can regulate it. Here's some more pictures. Here's the normal in the upper left-hand corner. These pictures are compliments of Dr. Ed Riley from University of California, San Diego. Uh, these are some of his patients. You can see the bottom left that there is distortion of the cortex and the gyri and sulci, but most important, look at the corpus callosum. Follow it from the front all the way back, and as you get to the latter part of the midsection, you see a thinning, and this actually is called thinning of the corpus callosum. On the bottom right-hand picture, you can see the corpus callosum is barely there. So what does this tell us? One of the primary effects of alcohol use in early pregnancy, and often even before the woman knows she's pregnant because the corpus callosum starts forming around, uh, you know, around three weeks gestation, three weeks after conception. And so long before most women even know they're pregnant. The way this plays out is if we look at it again from information processing, the way the brain takes information in and uses it, the behavioral difficulties we see in children and adolescents with prenatal alcohol exposure fall into three major domains. Neurocognitive functioning, self-regulation, and adaptive functioning. Now let's look at each of these separately for a moment. Neurocognitive functioning looks at global cognition, so that's IQ, but also executive functioning 
falls under neurocognitive. And executive functioning is the ability to plan ahead, to think ahead, to, to plan and complete a task. So that's why often you'll ask your child to go to his room and pick up his shoes and bring them to you. And he'll go to his room, but then he doesn't pick up his shoes. And uh, you get frustrated because you think he's not listening to you. But this is part of that executive functioning deficit. Learning disabilities fall into this category and memory problems, especially working memory. Now I'm going to give you a memory test right now. I know many of you are just sitting at your computers. So I want you to answer this question out loud. Now I won't be able to hear you, but I, I would ask you to participate. So, okay, here's your first task. Tell me your telephone number. Okay, so many of you answered that just right away. Uh, you were able to say it, no problem. Now I'm going to give you a next task. Tell me your telephone number backwards. Now you see, that's a little more difficult. What you had to do is pull your telephone number out of long-term memory, and some of you said it to yourself, memorized it essentially, and then were able to say it backwards, your auditory learners. And some of you posted your telephone number. You looked at it. You had your imaginary telephone number up in front of you. You could see it floating up there in front of you. And then you were able to read the numbers backwards, your visual learners. But whatever way you do it is, is perfectly acceptable. It's perfectly normal. But that's working memory taking information and out of memory and manipulating it to solve problems, uh, to, to address issues, to regulate your behavior. And these are some of the reasons that, that often get into the school issues. Uh, and that's why when we work with teachers, uh, and I'll, I'll put in a plug here, we have a new book coming out next year on educating children with fetal alcohol syndrome. And uh, we're, we have specific uh, strategies for, for addressing all of these difficulties. But I think you can see, this is why when you work with your child at night with his multiplication tables, and he knows them down cold, and he gets to school the next day, and you get a note from the teacher that says, you didn't help Johnny with his multiplication tables. And you say, yes, I did. And the teacher says, but he doesn't know them. It's called Swiss cheese memory. These things come and go. And this is all related to the memory problems associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. Now, the second area is self-regulation. And this is where really the issues of uh, attachment start coming in. So children with self-regulation difficulties associated with alcohol exposure have difficulty focusing on paying attention, on regulating their states of arousal. And so you'll see they'll be up and excited and high and all of a sudden will drop down and be low. They'll have mood swings. Uh, they'll be impulsive. And in a young infant, now remember, attachment is a two-way street. And if a mother is giving an infant cues, and he can't focus, and he gets over-aroused, hyper-aroused from the input, and so what he does is shut down to protect himself, the child is not able to provide his, or to play his role in attachment. And that's how we start seeing attachment issues in children uh, who have been prenatally exposed to alcohol because they can't play their role in attachment, that interactive, dyadic uh, interchange. But so often you go to a therapist and the therapist blames it on the foster or the adoptive parent, that you're not providing the nurturing that this child needs, when in fact it's because the child is not able to respond. So part of our work is working with parents, new parents especially, no matter what age the child, in ways to enhance attachment and interaction that, that allows for paying attention to the child's difficulties with attention and arousal. 
So I hope that if you have questions, you'll send in your questions. Uh, this is, as you know, this is much harder to do over a webinar uh, when I can't read your body language or your puzzled looks. The third area is adaptive functioning. And one of the key difficulties we see with the older children is reading social cues. So this plays into the attachment issue also because reading facial expressions, putting behaviors and actions and words into the context of the social situation is where the children get into problems and that plays in for the younger child also. So for the infant, reading your cues is very difficult. So what we've been talking about is the infant's readiness for attachment. What do children need? Children need one adult who will always be there. And I have been with families that are falling apart. The parents feel like failures. It's affecting their relationship. It's affecting other children in the family because this one child is the, the root cause of so many problems within the family. But remember, that child needs you to always be there for him or her. One of the things you want to do is to be sure to give the child words with which to characterize and express emotions. Uh, so what you want to do is, is observe and play back for the child. So if your child is getting frustrated and getting angry as he, before he, uh, you know, before this trigger allows him to blow up, what you need to say is, I see that you are getting angry. Now you have to make it an I message. You know, you can't say, you're angry, that won't work. But either a question, are you feeling angry? or I see you're getting angry, we'll give the child that word. And one of, in one of our research studies, we use the uh, terminology, um, how does your engine run, which some of you, comes from the alert program. Uh, and we found this is a great way to help children recognize not only their emotions, but their state of arousal. And we build out of cardboard or a poster board a speedometer and divide it into three sections, too high, too low, and in the middle, just right. And put a speed dial and let the child dial in. And uh, if you see your child getting out of control, you can say, Johnny, how does your engine run? And he'll be able to say, my engine is too high. And that's your chance to say, what can we do to make your engine just right? and he'll be able to come up with some ideas. Chewing on a carrot stick, doing biofeedback exercises, there are a lot of strategies you can use. And again, this works in the school also. Protection from exposure to violence. So many of our children who have been adopted uh, had early lives that were uh, enmeshed in violence, and this, the effects of trauma on long-term outcomes of children uh, in and of itself without the prenatal exposure. But what we have in the children that you have in your homes is we have children who are biologically vulnerable. They're born vulnerable because of biologic changes in the brain, such as the corpus callosum I showed you earlier. And now they get born into a family that's using drugs, or uh, there's violence, so a world that is going to make that vulnerable child even worse. And many times when I talk to child protection agencies, I challenge them uh, to say that you are bringing in children to your system that are biologically vulnerable and you're making them worse through, this, through the kinds of services that you are not providing. And I think that's something we have to consider. And then finally, inductive discipline. Uh, setting boundaries, helping children learn to be proactive than, rather than reactive in their behaviors. So what can you do? 
Now, this is mainly uh, focused on uh, the newly adoptive parents who are adopting young children. And the first thing I want to say after having worked with so many families and so many families reading so many books, the first thing I tell them is I don't want them reading any books. I don't want them going on any websites. I don't even want them reading my books until I think they're ready for them because I want new parents to be able to follow their own instincts. We don't want to get in the way of your good instincts. And this brings us to bedtime rituals. And I put it three times. No crying to sleep. Do not leave your child to cry himself to sleep. If I need to say that again, I'll say it again. Your child should not be allowed to cry himself to sleep. He's asking for something, and you need to be there for him. Rock him, hold him, eventually work through. But, you know, my kids didn't sleep through the night till they were about 18 months. Uh, and, you know, that, that's life, folks. If you're going to have a child, that's just what life is like. Uh, I'm sympathetic. Uh, I'm almost empathic uh, to your sleep deprivation, but I think we have to think of the child. Uh, and sometimes, even older, if you're adopting a four- and five-year-old child, a six-year-old child, uh, you're going to find bedtime is a very difficult time. Uh, part of the issue is that sleep is a regulatory behavior. So one of the ways that children present with regulation disorders is in sleep, sleep problems. And sometimes we use a, a, a very mild medication uh, that will help the child sleep, and just good sleep will help improve behaviors the next day. But again, you know, bath time, reading to the child, then going to bed, lying down with the child a while, a while, whatever fits best to your routine, but have a routine that you go through every night. Play baby games, and I'll tell you, this even works with adolescents that have come into new homes. Uh, you don't call them baby games, of course, but think of ways that you can provide uh, kind of a, a very playful, joyful structure for the child or adolescent uh, through games, and incorporate in those games nurturing touch. Now, remember many of the children that you bring in through the child welfare system have suffered sexual violence. And so you have to be very careful about touch when the child first comes into your home. There must be uh, trust on both sides of the equation before, as you work toward full embrace. And you'll just have to read your child and read yourself and, uh, to really get the timing down on that. Uh, and then no babysitters for a minimum of three months and hopefully at least six months after a new child comes into your home. Uh, I know in this day and age we have mothers and fathers that are working, but uh, I make it very clear with the families that I work with that uh, for a minimum of the first three months and if at all possible the first six months, one of you, the mother or father, or both need to be home full-time with that child. And I'm a grandfather, and I love to be with my grandchildren, uh, and so I understand uh, grandparents wanting to be the sole babysitters for a new child, uh, but no, mom and dad need to be with that baby for the first three to six months. And then, grandma, you can start babysitting. All of this leads to our overall therapeutic model, which does incorporate attachment issues. And this, we've published uh, extensive research on this model, uh, and uh, I'm going to give you our website at the end. If there are any, as I've mentioned various research, is there, if there's anything that's piqued your interest, you can go to our website and email me through our website and I will send, there's no charge for it, but I will send you a copy of the research article. Uh, some, some adoptive families like to have research articles in hand when they go to their doctor or to their school. Uh, and we have a, a wealth of, of research available for you. 
But our therapeutic model uh, works this way. Look to the left where it says parent education and support. I cannot stress enough why parent support is so vital. Many adoptive families that we work with come in, they have their initial evaluation, and when I have to present to them the diagnosis that in fact there is brain damage from prenatal alcohol exposure, the most common, by far the most common response is both parents, mother and father, will break down, start crying, and say, everybody's been blaming us for his behavior. Uh, and I even had a pediatrician uh, say to one, family, to one mother who was expressing concern by, about a child, he said, you don't need to be so worried. You're an adoptive mother. If you were a real mother, you wouldn't be so anxious. So needless to say, that mother finally wised up and brought her child to us. But uh, there is that attitude of blame the parents, and uh, you need a lot of education and support. To the, fourth, to the far right side, when we work with the children, we focus on sensory processing, all based on that uh, information processing model I told you about. So how they take in and use sensory information and executive functioning, how they plan and uh, complete a task. All of this is done in a dyadic model, and this is where the attachment comes in. We do not accept children for therapy unless one or both parents also participate. Whether you're a foster parent or an adoptive parent or a biologic parent, are a temporary caregiver, you must be involved. Remember, what do children need? Children need one person, one adult, who will always be there for them. Now, placements may change, but often when we implement this kind of therapy, the number of placements go down. So dyadic therapy is at the heart of it. Now, through the parent education and support, we decrease the feelings of parent stress, and we help parents feel more competent to handle their children's difficulties. On the child's perspective, we improve self-regulation, the ability to regulate behaviors and emotions. When you're able to accomplish that, you get attunement between the parent and the child. They can read each other's cues, and they can respond to each other's cues. And often what I tell parents is their goal is to be able to read the inner life of their child. Of course, when you get better attunement and interactions, you enhance the ability of the child and the parent to interact, to problem solve, to manage behaviors. And over the long term, what we've shown in our research is you get improved behavior, neurocognitive functioning, school readiness, and long-term mental health. So that's the picture of what I was trying to, to give you a basic understanding of attachment difficulties in children with prenatal alcohol exposure. If you are interested, there are, our website, and the website is down here at the bottom, ntiupstream.com, there are just literally hundreds of different materials specifically developed for foster and adoptive parents working with children with prenatal alcohol and drug exposure. If you're relatively new or you really want to get a very good understanding of the issues, uh, my most recent book, The Mystery of Risk, uh, really covers all of this from the basics of FAS to the impact of other drugs the child may be exposed to, attachment issues, mental health issues, uh, how to tell if behavior is just normal child behavior or is behavior related to the prenatal exposure. So that's available online. We're very proud of this. This is a film. Uh, Kathy mentioned that I'm in my retirement phase of life. Uh, I call it preferment. I do what I prefer. And what I prefer is to get this information out to the public. And so one of our strategies, we have our own film production um, section. And um, 
we recently, it came out in January, this film, Moment to Moment, Teens Growing Up with FASDs. Now, I didn't make the film, so I can tell you it is spectacular. It's, we've shown it all over the country and internationally. Uh, it's received uh, a number of war awards. Uh, it's been shown before state legislatures. Uh, and especially adoptive and foster parents buy it, watch it, and then take it into their school because much of what we've talked about today, uh, it goes into more depth, especially the brain issues and how much of the behaviors and difficulties are brain-based. And it has helped schools understand how best to serve the children. And again, you can, the link, direct link to moment to moment, and you can see a brief, there's a, uh, at this site, there also is a trailer for the film. There are a lot of other materials, including comic books for children to read about FAS, for parents to read with them. Uh, so this is our overall website. You can contact me through this website directly also. Uh, and my goal was to complete this section in 45 minutes, which we've done, because I would like to take the last 15 minutes for questions. Um, so Andy, have any questions come in? Hi, Ira. Hi. Yeah, this is Andy Catcher at NoFast. Thanks for that great presentation. And uh, yes, there are some uh, questions that people have sent in, so I'll just uh, ask some of those of you. Uh, so okay. we're asking a question about what resources are there for children that did fairly well with attachment as infants but are having difficulties with attachment issues older at age 10 or so? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd be careful of saying it's attachment because around 10 or 11, things go to hell. Uh, puberty, the pre-pubertal period is starting, and you know most teenagers are psychotic anyway, and when you get prenatal alcohol exposure with executive functioning deficits, uh, sensory issues, puberty is a very difficult time for these children. So for a, there, I think the place to start, and you're gonna hear me, I'm gonna say this over and over, if your child has not had a good, comprehensive neuropsychological evaluation, that's where you need to start. You need to find out what brain effects there are, and then from a mental health perspective, how that child is functioning socially and emotionally. I think you'll find, if you had a pretty good attachment early on, this in truth is not an attachment issue, but rather it's the self-regulation, and uh, the other difficulties coming to fore as your child uh, is entering puberty. Now, let me caution you, this brings up another issue. Unfortunately, the rate of co-occurring mental health disorders in children with prenatal alcohol exposure, most studies show 85 to 95 percent of the children have a co-occurring mental health disorder. And so when you have your evaluation, you're going to want to pay attention to mental health disorders also. Again, you have to be very careful. It's very easy to label a child bipolar when in fact he is not bipolar. It's the emotional regulation difficulties he's having. So again, you need a good evaluation by someone who knows prenatal alcohol exposure. Great, thank you very much. And uh, we have another question, kind of a twist on that, of a child that's about the same age, is about 10 or 11, and is having uh, difficulties with attachment, but that also had difficulties with attachment going back, basically since uh, they were adopted, uh, you know, at an early age uh, as an infant. And what sort of resources are available uh, for somebody that's still having a great deal of a difficulty with that? Yeah, um, there. I don't know this person that asked the question. I don't know what part of the country they live in. Uh, you know, I, what you can do is if you email me uh, at at the website I've got posted up there, and uh, let me know where you live. Uh, I could perhaps point you in the right direction. Uh, but there are there are therapists usually. They're a master's level licensed therapist uh, that there are many, in, especially in larger cities, that specialized in doing attachment therapy. 
Now you have to be careful. There are some really crazy kinds of therapies out there. Uh, there were some famous ones where some children died after holding therapy and all that. So be very careful. Again, if you can find an attachment therapist that understands um, um, prenatal alcohol exposure, uh, you be best. Uh, the other thing is uh, attachment therapists who understand and have experience with adoptive families is helpful. Great, thank you. And we got a question asking um, for you to speak to the issue of a child that uh, seems too attached, very attached, uh, has difficulty staying in their own room at night, or you know, not being able to to be apart from a parent without um, having emotional difficulties. Yeah, uh, you know, again, this is difficult without knowing the child. It could be purely behavioral. And if it's purely behavioral, then kind of a weaning, uh, set up a calendar. And uh, I don't know if you're talking specifically about bedtime, but let's just use that as an example. Um, bedtime start out and say, okay, on, mark on the calendar on these days, uh, I'm going to stay in the room with you for 30 minutes, and then I'm going to go. And then uh, the next week, I'm going to stay with you 25 minutes. So giving the child kind of structure and knowing what to expect helps quite a bit. Also, the use of comfort uh, items such as a blanket uh, or a, um, uh, you know, a, a teddy bear, something like that helps. And then when I hear a child about like, like this, if it's not... It, rather than behavioral, it really is rooted in the difficulties with FAS. I think of sensory processing issues, and I wonder if this individual's child has been assessed for sensory integration uh, issues. There are things you can do, like if there are sensory issues, using a weighted blanket uh, helps the child, soothes the child quite a bit. Uh, uh, white noise, music. I mean, it, it would be hard for me to give specific uh, recommendations since I don't know the child. But uh, I would say, uh, again, I'm not sure this is an attachment issue. I think this really sounds more like um, uh, it could be sensory. So I would get a sensory integration evaluation. Thank you. And I had a question about asking um, if you've information about uh, attachment issues with a teenager as far as uh, not feeling attached to their siblings. <laughs> oh my. I just spent uh, two weeks with my four grandchildren. Uh, I w there were points I was going to ask the same question. Uh, you know, sibling relationships are difficult in the best of circumstances. So issues of age, you know, what's the age difference? Uh, issues of were, are the siblings biologic and the, the versus the adoptive child? Is that there? Um, you know, gender, birth order. There are so many factors that come together. Again, I would be very careful about using terms like attachment related to sibling issues. I don't think it's an issue of attachment uh, uh, necessarily. And um, I think in a, if, if it's really getting out of hand, I think a family therapist is what you need to assess the situation and to give you some guidance on how to handle sibling issues. All right, thank you. And we got a question asking about uh, what more can be done to educate pediatricians uh, about the facts of FASD, and uh, why aren't all pediatricians aware of FASD, and um, you know why are uh, groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics um, just recently coming out with a statement about no amount of alcohol being safe, and, and what more can be done in terms of pediatricians being educated? Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, whoever asked that question, I agree completely with you. I would direct any of you that are interested, again, this is a research paper we just published in Pediatrics in February this year. And again, we can't post, it's copyrighted, so we can't post it on our website. But if you ask us for it, we can send it to you. 
And what it shows, we did a study, uh, took a sample from about 3,000 children and studied a sample of children with and without FASDs. They were all foster and adopted children. And we showed that 85% of children with FASDs are misdiagnosed. They're given all sorts of other diagnoses, which also implies they also are on inappropriate medications. So if you want to look at the science or if you want to get that article, print it out and give it to your pediatrician, um, uh, it'll be available for you. Now, what is happening? Yes, this is a process. The Academy has, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics has finally come out as, with a statement, no amount of alcohol is safe. But the really good news is, is that the CDC partnered with the American Academy of Pediatrics and they put together, I guess you'd call it a committee, and there were about 12 of us on the committee. And we have written uh, a paper on the diagnosis, the recognition, diagnosis, and appropriate referrals for uh, pediatricians. It's in the process of being reviewed. I think, I hope it's going to be published in pediatrics, but it is the first step on a big educational campaign. And then um, the uh, Academy also is going to be putting out a toolkit associated with this paper, a toolkit for pediatricians on FASDs. So there is good news uh, on that front. Uh, I, agree, I spend a lot of my time traveling across the country uh, educating physicians, pediatricians and obstetricians and family practitioners on these issues. Uh, and I, I know that many of you face difficulties. Uh, but that the paper that I mentioned that was published uh, earlier this year in pediatrics has had a big impact. Uh, we're, we're getting a lot of really positive feedback from, from pediatricians and professionals who work in the field. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, just a couple quick uh, questions before we conclude. Uh, it's almost at uh, 3 o'clock. And uh, somebody was asking about um, what are the benefits um, or reasons uh, – getting a diagnosis of an FASD in terms of uh, what that might um, help with a child in terms of uh, services or access? Sure. sure. The, uh, what the research shows is if you identify the child with FASDs, so you'll notice I'm using the broad spectrum of alcohol exposure, if you identify the child and get him into appropriate treatment, before the age of six years, you significantly improve long-term outcome. Now, that's not to say after six years it's too late. We've published some studies of how to improve outcomes for the children when they're older also. But the key is to get that diagnosis and to get appropriate therapies that will address the specific issues this child has. So the research says the earlier the better. Great, thank you. And just uh, one last question here uh, that we have time uh, to get to is asking about uh, if there's uh, programs or resources available for school psychologists uh, to educate them about FASD. Well, uh, again, I've I have been doing I've I've paired up uh, with a uh, fellow who uh, is very well known in the field of special education. Uh, he's an educator. And uh, we are producing a book and a behavior management program for schools, for educators. We're hoping that will come out next year. Uh, right now, I would say a, psycho a school psychologist, if a school psychologist read The Mystery of Risk, that would give them a good <laughs> background. Uh, there are no specific programs I know of for school psychologists, but we hope by the end of next year, early 2017, will be out with our new book and materials for educators. All right, great. Thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to, again, thank you very much, Ira, uh, for this great presentation. And uh, thanks to everyone for the questions and for participating. And I'd just like to remind everyone that uh, the video, uh, the audio and video of the presentation, the recording of that will be available on the NOFAS website at nofast.org. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ira.
Thanks, Kathy. That was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye. Thanks, bye.